So Rachel mentioned in the intro 1.2 trillion. I'm going to use a bigger number, 10 trillion dollars. According to McKinsey, that's the current size of the private markets. Uh, as Rachel alluded to, obviously companies are staying private longer and longer, uh, and managers are launching new strategies to make the space more accessible to investors. Um, so it's a big topic. We only have a little over 20 minutes, um, but I'm fortunate to be joined by a terrific panel here. And so to start, I'll just turn it over to them um, to spend a minute or two on their strategy and, and their focus. So, Helen. Thanks so much, Jason. Uh, so I'm joining you from Wellington Management. As many of you know, we're a trillion plus investment manager with a global client base. Uh, we are active in all areas of the public markets, and we've also been investing in private companies for over two decades. And about a decade ago, we created a dedicated private investment platform uh, which has grown over that time to almost $7 billion in committed client capital across four fund families. And those are late stage growth, biotech, uh, climate, and an early stage tech platform which invests in companies founded by diverse entrepreneurs. Carrie. Great. I'm Carrie Lodge. I'm from Common Fund. Common Fund runs two businesses, an outsourced CIO business and a private capital business. We have about $25 billion in assets under management. About half of that is in the private capital business. We have uh, private equity funds, venture capital funds, real assets and sustainability funds across primaries, uh, co-investments, and secondaries. I head up our secondaries fund and our secondaries practice. Hello. Thanks. Low Tony, Plexo Capital. We are an investment management firm that focuses on early stage venture capital, both investing into venture capital funds as well as investing directly into startups. I started it while I was a partner at GV, formerly known as Google Ventures, the early stage investing unit of Alphabet, which is Google's holding company, and spun that out in 2018. Excited to be here and have a great conversation. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, everyone. So the topic is trends in private markets. I want to start with some of the longer term trends. You've all been investing in this space as your, your firms have for a number of years now. So Helen, give us a sense um, over the last cycle, over the last five to 10 years, how have you guys seen the private markets involved, uh, evolve? Thanks, so we've really seen a huge transformation in terms of where growth is occurring and where valuation is occurring across uh, private and public markets. And you know, maybe going back even a little further, about probably 15 years ago, uh, we really noticed that private companies um, were staying in the private markets longer. And originally, we thought that might have been driven by a regulatory catalyst. So in, in 2002, Sarbanes-Oxley made it more onerous for companies uh, to be in the public markets, to go public and, and to uh, stay public companies. Um, but as we spent more, more time in company boardrooms with, with management um, of these private companies, we really came to the conclusion that, in fact, uh, companies were staying private just because it made a lot more uh, strategic sense for them to go through the, the hyper growth phase of their life cycle away from the glare um, of, the, of the public markets and instead of kind of managing quarter to quarter, really be able to focus in on uh, building that next leg of growth, whether it's geographic expansion, product expansion, building out the sales force, um, or getting ready uh, for the public markets from an ESG perspective. Um, and that uh, trend has definitely continued uh, today. Um, those companies are still going public, uh, notwithstanding um, the, the uh, temporary closure, what we believe is a temporary closure of, of the IPO window, but those companies are still going public. Um, and, uh, in, you know, in, in, in our position at Wellington, we have the, p the potential to partner with them as they do transition to the public markets. But, you know, for all of you as investors, um, the picture that creates is that the private markets have increased more than fivefold, uh, while the, um, the small cap growth space is, has shrunk to a small fraction of what it was um, over two decades ago. So the, the percentage of uh, companies with a market cap of under a billion in the Russell 2000, which is supposed to be a small cap index, has gone from over 80% 
um, actually to about 15% today. So has that, that has big implications for um, how we think about partnering with our clients and their allocations and how they're harnessing growth. And Carrie, on, on the secondary side, that's perhaps one of the fastest growing segments within the, within the private markets, and Common Fund is perhaps one of the earlier investors. So speak to the evolution of that market, and maybe spend a minute or two on some of the different types of secondaries, just so our audience is, is up to speed. Sure. So I started in secondaries in 2000. Common Fund started in secondaries in the mid-1990s. I don't even think at the time people would have called it a secondary. Um, it's a very small market. Back in 2000, the market was less than a billion. It had a record um, market size of about $132 billion uh, last year. What the secondary market is doing is, is giving liquidity to investors that invest in the private markets. And as Jason alluded to, the market's now $10 billion. We're seeing investors across the board increase their allocations to private capital. Um, and as was mentioned earlier, you know, every given year about 3,000 funds are being raised. So there is a need for liquidity. Um, everyone's needs are different in portfolio management. And so we're seeing a huge growth in the secondary market. There's regular way LP transactions. That means you know, a private capital fund is usually 10 years with two one-year extensions, but we've seen that there's over um, $500 billion of assets and funds that are over 10 years old. Those are called tail-end funds. Um, so a lot of secondary investors are really helping investors clean up their portfolios, get rid of some of those older interests that they may be in, some of those managers that they may have invested in, you know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, they may not be re-upping with. Um, what's interesting is if you look at the secondary market in the first half of this year, 50% of the institutions selling into the secondary market were first-time sellers. So there's three components of the secondary market. There's the LP secondary market, where you have a one-on-one -on -one transaction within one institution that might be selling. There's also the GP-led market, which is about half the secondary market today. That market has really evolved. Coming out of the global financial crisis, we saw a lot of funds raised in 2004, 2005, 2006. Some of those were first-time funds. Um, others were longer-term uh, fund managers that weren't going to be able to re-up a new fund. So um, those were sort of what they call zombie assets, and those were restructurings. But it set up the structure for what is today's GP-led market and what is really an interesting market today. There are two types of um, continuation funds. There's multi-asset continuation funds, and then there's single-asset continuation funds. So historically, a private capital, uh, a private equity fund would sell its uh, exit all of its companies, um, and sometimes those exits would be to a larger financial sponsor. What we're now seeing in the secondary market is single-asset continuation funds where GPs hold on to their best assets um, and reconfigure their LP base uh, for that asset, giving investors the option for liquidity. So, um, you know, we're seeing half the market in the GP lets markets. That market has, you know, the potential to, to double, triple in size in the not too, too near distant future. And if you look at the $10 billion number, um, the secondary market today is, is less than 2% of the overall market in terms of size. So, this market, you know, I, I have colleagues that think it could be a trillion and not the too distant future, um, but easily by 2026 this market should double in size, if not triple. Um, and so it's a very a growing segment of the market, and especially with the current market conditions, uh, investors are going to need more and more portfolio management. I think it's a, perhaps a lesser known segment of the market, but Absolutely. one that's growing rapidly, and to your point, is, is certainly interesting given the environment that we're in right now. Um, Lo, on the early stage side, uh, you mentioned you, you started investing in the space back at Google Ventures. How have you seen that evolve uh, over the last decade plus? Yeah, I think many of the, the comments that, that our other panelists spoke to are definitely trends that we see accelerating. Uh, you know, companies staying private longer, um, you know, that leads to opportunities within the secondary market for sure, I think especially on the GP side. And I really think that when we start to look at where the opportunities are to capture growth and alpha, Without question, the private markets are where we're seeing big opportunities. I think Robert Smith said, I think very accurately, if one wants to follow trends around digital transformation, software development that's happening inside of companies or companies integrating software, 
if you want to go after those companies, you know, 98% of those companies are, are private. And so if one really wants to go after that trend, you almost are, are forced to go into the private market. There's many ways to be able to do that. And I think that's what's, what's really interesting. When I look at a lot of the investors that we see, and we focus on very early stage investors, the new strategies that they're using are, are pretty innovative, right? So I, th I think there's just so much opportunity, not only within private markets themselves, and a lot of that's being driven by technology, but I also think that there are some very clever ways that some of the new entrants into investing are capturing alpha. And Lo, I'm gonna stay with you. Let's, let's fast forward to today, the current market environment. Um, what are you hearing and seeing from founders um, on the early stage side? Obviously, the last few years, Fed policy, monetary policy has driven easy capital, easy money, which is driving valuations higher. Um, we're in a different world today, a different market today. Is that flowing through to the entrepreneurs and the founders or not quite yet? You know, it's, it's interesting. This is really more of a psychology question because what happens is it's clear to all the participants across both the public and the private markets that things have changed. Your point around the easy money, we'll probably within our lifetime never see that type of monetary policy that led to the rapid deployment of capital and the ability to even raise capital. And I think, you know, there's this kind of slow trickle down effect that one sees. I mean, obviously, the public markets react almost instantaneously to, to new policies by the Fed, macroeconomic, climate, geopolitical, um, challenges, but what we see is it takes a little longer for that to flow down to the, the early stage companies. It almost happens progressively, like the late stage companies we've seen impacted the most, and that's where we've seen the biggest drops in both valuations and round sizes, because those are the companies that are most easily compared to their public counterparts, because they're on the cusp of going public. I actually think that there's a great opportunity for entrepreneurs right now, because there's going to be less capital available, and that's actually a good thing for both entrepreneurs and investors. It's a good thing for entrepreneurs because entrepreneurs won't have to worry about competing against five companies that should have never gotten funded in the first place, diluting the talent base and kind of muddying up the, the quality of those companies that actually are the stars. And so I think historically what we've seen in these types of disruptions is we've seen a consolidation of talent, which is a good thing for entrepreneurs. We've also seen a little bit of a compression on the, the both round sizes and valuations. And so I think intuitively people would think that that means more dilution, less ownership of the company. But actually what the data is showing is that if we look at some of the data published recently by Carta, ownership is remaining about the same. So the entrepreneurs, even though they might not be raising as much in terms of the round size and valuations might be slightly down, they still are holding on to the company. So at the end of the day, I think that actually is a good thing for entrepreneurs if they can hold on to company and not have the pressure of a valuation that they have to almost be priced to perfection to grow into. Yeah, I think, I think that is a very key point, right? This is, this is almost obviously a better environment for investors with reset valuations, but it's also a better environment for founders and entre entrepreneurs, right? Because if they're maximizing valuation, as many did in the last six to 12 months, it's gonna, have, gonna be a problem attracting talent when you're paying an equity. That's right. And it's gonna be harder for them to grow into that valuation. So ho hopefully uh, that trickles through. Um, Helen, I'm gonna jump over to you and then, and then we'll go back to Carrie. Um, Wellington invests across stages in the private markets, but also very, very active in the public market. So what is your view on, on the valuation um, across markets and stages? So it's, a, it's an interesting question. I think you know, we've seen this uh, corrections, very significant correction in the public markets. Uh, from the perspective of our private investment teams, it's actually kind of a return to more of a rational environment. And so our, we have the view that those uh, multiples are not you know, uh, going to snap back all of a sudden, but this is actually um, more of a return to sens sensible multiples. Um, to address your question in terms of how private uh, market expectations are adjusting, um, there's certainly a lag effect for sure. And um, I think the reason for that is a lot of uh, companies raised uh, plenty of cash over the last year or two. And so we anticipate that some of those expectations will be reset um, progressively. 
over the coming quarters as those companies need cash to uh, continue to invest in, in their growth. And uh, we, we actually refer to uh, some of this as the, the stages of grief. Um, and <laughs> we may still be in a little bit of uh, denial. We are seeing some pockets of, of better valuation on the, on the private side, some resetting, uh, but we do think that that will take a few quarters to play out. And Carrie, I'll, I'll ask the, the same question, but in the framework of, of secondaries. Um, what are you seeing as far as LP stakes? Are, is there distress out there? What are discounts looking like? Yeah, I think that the distress hasn't come quite yet, but we are seeing um, portfolio management. We are seeing, and we are going to see the denominator effect come into play where, you know, your public portfolio uh, devalues and, and the private portfolio is now a, a too big allocation of your portfolio. So we're going to see more and more sellers. We're seeing more one-off transactions from sellers. As I said, we saw new entrants into the market um, selling for the first time. So you know, there's always a lag in, the, in terms of valuations in the private market. So, and we price in the secondary market on a lag. So we're right now pricing off of March and June values. So we're, you know, um, because of that lag, the secondary market will be smaller this year than last year. It'll probably be about 110 billion, down from 132 billion. But then we'll see 2023 as a, a massive year in secondaries. Um, and if you look back, you know, to 2000, 2000, 2007, 2008, 2009, you saw that that trend. Um, so I would expect the market to be, um, you know, the largest market ever in 2023 as you're going to see more sellers, not necessarily distressed, but having volatility in the portfolio, having to reallocate portions of their portfolio. So I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, we only have a, a few minutes left here, hopefully try and get to two more questions. Um, I want to touch on diversity, and I'm, and I'm going to start with Lowe because it's really foundational to what Plexo does, but each of you um, and, and your firms um, have incorporated diversity into, into your, your fund management. Um, how has that evolved, Lo, and, and how do you think about diversity, even from just an investment lens, as you're allocating to diverse managers and diverse founders? It started when I was a partner at, at GV. We wanted access to more deal flow, and we made five LP commitments to seed stage funds led by black general partners. And I saw that and thought there was an opportunity to build a business. And the thesis was around the indirect path that black general partners, and I added women and other people of color, because in that path and that journey, they create these other networks that give them access to, to differentiated deal flow. It's much more important at the early stage because once the math and the numbers start to come in, people can see the opportunities there. But for us, what it's meant is we have the ability to get to managers that have access to early stage deal flow that other folks may not be seeing and therefore have an opportunity for a lower valuation at the entry point and build a relationship with the entrepreneur long term. And I think it's something that we'll see continue to play out and we're super bullish about the alpha it drives. And Carrie, same question to you. I know Common Fund has written a lot about this. How do you guys think about diversity? Yeah, I mean, we think diversity is very important. Um, we're continuing to uh, get metrics on, on our underlying managers. We have an active program, actively trying to get more diverse managers within our programs. Um, and it's a trend that we're seeing across the private markets and it's very encouraging. And Helen, I know one of your colleagues spoke earlier this week on the topic, but just to uh, reiterate to the audience a uh, minute, minute or two on, on Wellington's approach to diversity. Yeah, so, so Jackson Cummings, who heads up uh, Wellington Access Ventures, and by the way, he's a huge fan of yours, Lo, and uh, has been a collaborator on some, uh, some interesting deals. Um, we uh, created a platform uh, last year which invests in early stage companies funded by diverse entrepreneurs. And I think what's been interesting, and I think I uh, would really agree with your comments, Lo, on the importance of differentiated networks and, and deal flow is uh, the team has really flipped the script on kind of the clubby nature of venture capital and uh, really created, they actually two senior members of the team founded Black VC, uh, created a, a network uh, which has allowed us and many others um, to develop as uh, venture capitalists and also create a really differentiated uh, network and um, access to interesting deals. Great. Well, that's our time. It always goes much quicker than we expect, but thank you all for listening.